Welcome back. And we'll, we'll continue with uh, Thomas Traherne, and actually we'll finish up with the, with the entire course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it much, as much as I have. But to, to start with today, um, I'd like to engage in a, a kind of experiment. So put your book down, put your pencil down. I want you to close your eyes and engage in, in this um, experiment, I guess. Close your eyes and let yourself relax. Take a couple deep breaths. And I want you to try to conjure up your very earliest memory. What's the earliest thing you can recall? And I want you to, as you're, you're evoking this memory, I want you to pay attention to a few things. First, of course, pay attention to what the event was. What is it? What is this thing that you remember from the earliest, earliest point of your life? What is it? Who's involved or where are you? What's involved? Also, I want you to try to pinpoint how old you were at the time. Just sit with that for a minute. Just look around. And then the last thing I want to ask you is, how are you seeing this memory? Are you, are you seeing it as if through your own eyes or as if you're observing yourself? And if you're observing yourself, from what, what vantage point are you observing yourself? I'll give it another few seconds with that. Okay, so I want you come come back. Now, I've done this experiment with kids in eighth grade. When I taught eighth grade a few times, I've done it with college students. I've done it with graduate students. And it's interesting that there's there's a kind of a commonality. Very often, uh, when the when the people remember this, they're about two or three. The latest, you know, sometimes a person's five when they when they can conjure up an early memory. Uh, often, it has to do with being afraid or something like this. Um, not, not always. And but interesting though is the vantage point. Now, a lot of people, not everybody, will see this as if they were behind, usually looking over the shoulder, you know, trying to. And but you, it, but but often they cannot see their own face, but they can see what's going on kind of from behind. Now. Why is that? I don't know what it was for you. Uh, the other thing, very you know, sometimes I shouldn't say very often, but I'd say five percent, ten percent of the time, a person's seeing it through their own eyes. Now, interestingly, very often uh, a person's memory is triggered by a photograph. Um, so they have a photograph, so they kind of think they remember something about something, but they actually maybe what they remember is the photograph. Um, my own earliest, um, I won't get into all the details, but it's, I was, pr I, I, I can figure out I was about two and a half. And the only reason I know this is because I can, you know, trace back what I was doing. We lived at my grandmother's house and my sister, who was a year younger than I am, 
and I were playing underneath the table, and my parents had just come back from Christmas shopping, and they told us that they talked to Santa Claus for us. And the reason I know this is because we were living with my grand grandmother when my my brother was born, and he's he was born on November thirtieth, about, about two and a half years after I was born. So obviously, my mom couldn't get out of the house because she had a, a newborn. And they could just get out, I think it must have been a couple of days before Christmas, if not Christmas Eve. And I just remember that. And they brought they brought me and my sister those little plastic cowboys and Indians. <laughs> they only gave us one of each. And I remember it was red, an Indian crawling on I remember that. So that's how I remember what it, what it was. But the, the curious thing when I did this exercise the first time is I was seeing myself from behind, but not seeing my face. Now, do I have a, why, do I know why that is? No, I do not know why that is, but it's interesting. You know, is it because you, you are not fully into your body yet? I don't know, I don't know, but it's certainly fascinating. Um, and what I have noticed though, that the people I have talked to who saw through their own eyes, usually they were older in their, for, in their first memory. They were four or five not two or three. And so they were inside their own eyes looking at the world, kind of looking out like you see sometimes in films, like getting the point of view of the protagonist, for instance. Um, and I often noticed that those people were more concrete thinkers, you know, whereas the people who had, seeing it from, from outside of the body, so to, say, so to speak, were uh, less concrete thinkers, more imaginative, you know, that's just an observation. I, it's not, certainly not scientific, but I think it's interesting. And and why do I do this? Because, of course, Thomas Traherne is interested in this moment of when we fell from grace, in a way. Because, in a way, we, we each recapitulate the fall. We start in innocence, you know, songs of innocence, and then of experience, according to William Blake. We start in innocence and then fall into experience, right? Uh, I think I talked about it before, but Terrence Malick, the filmmaker in his film, The Tree of Life, it's one of the themes of that film is, you know, the, the, the protagonist, or the main character, Jack, it's his coming of age, and you can see him as, an, as a grown-up, he's about my age, played by Sean Penn, and he's kind of world-weary, you know? And he's tortured by the, the suicide of his brother, which took place when they were teenagers, you know. So he's kind of carried that ghost around with him. And he, but much of the film is his recollection of felicity, right? And and seeing how things get compromised over time. And it's a beautiful film if you haven't seen it. And Traherne is trying to get us back there. And I and I think Terrence Malick in that film is trying to get us back there too. Even though not not ignoring that bad stuff happens, you know that there are, you know we have biographies, we have experiences, and and they're not not good, <laughs> you know you, they they compromise us. We we do fall into sin. We do fall into um, the fall. That's why they call it the fall. It's a good word. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the centuries of meditations, which was also found in manuscript. Uh, it's suspected that, uh, what was her name? Hopton. Susanna Hopton was, was the, the woman he prepared these for. And it's, it might not, maybe he, that he didn't, but they were certainly prepared as uh, exercises in uh, spiritual direction. He's trying to give spiritual counsel to somebody. And as well as to himself, you know, and, and to record it for posterity. And again, this is something he didn't write his name on. So he was not interested in being people, even people finding it after after his death. George Herbert, at least, gave he gave the temple to Nicholas Ferrar, or his name was on it. They knew who it was from, but Traherne didn't wasn't even interested in that. You know, he, he entered back into felicity, full felicity at the age of thirty seven or thirty eight. Um. And interesting with Susanna Hopton, uh, so she, uh, he was giving spiritual direction to her, 
uh, and she converted to Catholicism at during the English Civil War. And remember, we talked about this with uh, with Vaughn. Not that he converted to Catholicism, but he became more Catholic in a way. The more Cromwell would put them put pressure on the, the royalists, you know, who were more closer to being Catholic than the Puritans. And so, so I think Susanna Hopton probably became Catholic out of protest, you know, a subversive move, you know. And uh, but but she returned to the Anglican Church with the restoration of the monarchy. So interesting, interesting dynamics. And, and this uh, we and we said the same thing about uh, Robert Herrick, even though he's not a, a subject of this study. Uh, he but he did the same thing. He he kind of upfronted the, the Catholic strains of of his parish life and his philosophy just to stick a, uh, a finger in the eye of the Puritans who kicked him out of his, his living at, at uh, in Cornwall, Devonshire. All right, so let's, let's talk about the centuries of meditations. Now, they're called centuries because there's a hundred, and there are, they're, they're called the five centuries. The fifth one is not complete. There's a hundred in each century. Uh, the fifth one did not get finished and only made it to number 10. And then, of course, uh, Traherne became sick and died. I'm not sure what he was. I don't think anybody knows what he was, what afflicted him. Uh, but he died before he could finish. But, so their meditations, like as I said, works of spiritual direction, you know, you give these to somebody to meditate upon. So they're not, it's not really something you read cover to cover that you can do that. They're, they're more Almost you could just read them, open up at, at random places and meditate on whatever's, whatever you come upon. But let's, let's, we'll kind of go through it in order. We certainly won't we'll read all of them, and not even all the things I marked in the book. But look at, look at first century. Uh, number 31. Yet further... You never enjoy the world aright, for you so love the beauty of enjoying it that you are covetous in earnest to persuade others to enjoy it. And so perfectly hate the abominable corruption of men in despising it that you had rather suffer the flames of hell than willingly be guilty of their error. There is so much blindness and ingratitude and damned folly in it. The world is a mirror of infinite beauty, yet no man sees it. It is a temple of majesty, yet no man regards it. It is a region of light and peace, did not men disquiet it. It is the paradise of God. It is more to man since he has fallen than it was before. It is the place of angels and the gate of heaven. When Jacob walked out of his dream, he said, God is here, and I wist it not. How dreadful is this place. This is none other than the, than the house of God and the gate of heaven. So what is? Just that little place where Jacob put his head on a stone and saw the angels ascending and descending? No! Everywhere is the gate of heaven. The world is a mirror of infinite beauty, yet no man sees it. And here again, it goes back to this theme of learning how to see. How do we see? Why is it we don't see? What, how have we blinded ourselves? And in 32, just to continue a little bit, he, uh, he says, Can any ingratitude be more damned than that which is fed by benefits? Or folly greater than that which, that which bereaveth us of infinite treasures? They despise them merely because they have them, and invent ways to make themselves miserable in the presence of riches. They study a thousand newfangled treasures, which God never made. And then grieve and repine that they be not happy. And he never even saw a cell phone. They dote on their own works and neglect gods, which are full of majesty, riches, and wisdom. And having fled away from them because they are solid, divine, and true, greedy, greedily persuading tinsel vanities, they walk on in darkness and will not understand. That's a allusion or paraphrase from Psalm 82. They do the works of darkness and delight in the riches of the prince of darkness and follow them till they 
They come into eternal darkness. According to that of the psalmist, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Right? It's like, and why does he say, and this is from Psalm 82 as well, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Because this is so jacked up, is basically what he's saying. Because it's right there. You can see it. It's present right here. But how can you live that way, right? Uh, can you get a job doing that? That's the, that's the point he's making. That's exactly the point he's making. And he actually, he, he reiterates that theme quite a bit in the first century. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, let's take a look then. Let's skip up to the... Oh, there's so many good things. <laughs> there's so much good stuff. Let's go to the second century. An interesting take on the fall. And this is uh, second century number five. The counsel which our Savior giveth in the Revelation to the church of Ephesus, is by all churches and by every soul diligently to be observed. Remember from whence thou art fallen and repent, which intimate, intimates our duty of remembering our happiness in the estate of innocence. Now look at this. One of the few times he, he mentions sin, and he says, now this church is right. The church says, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. Right? Ew. And then go back to the Monty Python thing, right? Oh, God, we're so sorry. Oh, stop it. Stop that groveling. But Traherne answers that with, you know, yes, we repent of your sin, which intimates our duty of remembering our happiness in the estate of innocence. So for him, repentance isn't self-flagellation. Repentance is seeing reality. Remembering our, our, our duty, he says, a duty of remembering our happiness in the estate of innocence. It's a duty. You, you. This is what you need to do. So this is very foreign from so much mysticism, so much religious writing that dwells on sin and my, I'm such a sinner, right? Oh, and he doesn't do that. He's like, come on. Because if you dwell on that, you know, like Blake would say, they became what they beheld. So return to the state of innocence Right? And as he says in 7, uh, 2 7, place yourself therefore in the midst of the world as if you were alone and meditate, pay, meditate upon all the services which it doth unto you. Suppose, suppose the sun were absent and conceived the world to be a dungeon of darkness and death about you. You will then find his beams more delightful than the approach of angels. And lo, the abomination of the sinful blindness, whereby you see not the glory of so great and bright a creature, because the air is filled with, filled with its beams. Then you will think that all its light shineth for you, and confess that God hath manifested himself indeed in the preparation of so divine a creature. You will abhor the madness of those who esteem a purse of gold more than it. Alas! What could a man do with a purse of gold in an everlasting dungeon? And shall we prize the sun less than it, which is the light and fountain of all our pleasures? You will then abhor the preposterous method of those who in an evil sense are blinded with its beams, and to whom the presence of the light is the greatest darkness. For they who would repine at God without the sun are unthankful having it, and therefore only despise it because it is created. And he, and he, in the beginning of 12, 2, 12, he says, Entering thus far into the nature of the sun, we may see a little heaven in the creatures. We may see a little heaven in the creatures. And I, I do have to confess, I mean, this is kind of like my, my ongoing, I shouldn't say struggle, but effort my ongoing effort is to see that is to see that and, and I, this is what if I learned anything through, through sociology or through Thomas Traherne it's, 
It's that. It's, you know, we need to learn how to see it. You know, how to see, I mean, to, to, to stand still and behold the glories of God as revealed in nature, but in the, in the simple things. And in 2.17, for instance, he says, Besides these immediate pleasures here beneath, there are many sublime and celestial services which the world doth do. It is a glorious mirror, comes back again, wherein you may see the verity of all religion. Enjoy the rem remainders of paradise and talk with the deity. Apply yourself vigorously to the enjoyment of it. For in it you shall see the face of God, and by enjoying it, be wholly converted to him. And in 18 he says, You shall be glorified, you shall live in communion with him, you shall ascend into the throne of the highest heavens, you shall be satisfied, you shall be made greater than the heavens, you shall be like him when you, when you enjoy the world as he doth. You shall converse with his wisdom, goodness, and power above all worlds, and therefore shall know him, to know whom is to su a sublime thing for it is life eternal. Now, this reminds me, not quite the same thing, but I went, after I graduated from my, my master's degree, a year or so later, I was invited back to the, to the university, the University of Detroit Mercy in, in Detroit, Michigan. And I don't know if he was, the, what he was, the vice president or what he was, he was a Jesuit, and he invited us back to this thing where they were trying to get involvement with with alumni, I don't think I followed up on it. But, but the, what really impressed me is that we're, we're sitting around drinking beer and eating hors d'oeuvres, and he said something that really sat with me, and I think it's it's a very Tom, uh, Thomas Trahernian uh, idea that God loves the world as it is, as it is. You know, and I and that's part of what what, it, what he described as a part of centerpiece of Jesuit spirituality, which I'm not sure if I that's my interpretation of Jesuit spirituality. But I like the idea anyway. God loves the world as it is, and if we learn how to love the world as it is, and not as we have encumbered it. This is what Traherne's saying here. That's when we encounter God. We are con wholly converted to him. And that is, and he says that, you shall be glorified. You shall live in communion with him. Now glorified, that's, in most Christian theology, the glorification comes, you know, at the resurrection. But Traherne's saying, it's going to come, you know, you can come to the glorification now. No, it might. We might say it's a, it's a precursor to the the general glorif glorification that comes in the resurrection, but it is a kind of resurrection, is it not? It's it's a, it's Lazarus come here. Right, it's awakened from our dead, our deadened nature, because we don't know how to see. Awakened from our dead in nature. And interesting, uh, also in the second century, I don't want to dwell on it a whole lot, but you can tell there's a sophiological strain. He always outs himself. And of course, he wouldn't have had that language of sophiology. He would have had Burma, you know, which I'm pretty sure he read Burma. But, and also he would have had Neoplatonism. He would have known, been familiar with Plotinus and, or P Plato. In, in uh, 2nd century 21, he says, When Amasis, the king of Egypt, sent to the wise men of Greece to know quid pulcrimum, what is the most beautiful, uh, pul quid pulcrimum, upon due and mature consideration, they answered, the world. What is the most beautiful? the world. The world certainly being so beautiful that nothing visible is capable of more. Were we to see it only once, that first appearance would amaze us. But being daily seen, we observe it not. Ancient philosophers have thought God to be the soul of the world. 
Since therefore this visible world is the body of God, not his natural body, but which he hath assumed, let us see how glorious his wisdom is in manifesting himself thereby. And that's his, his sophiology, right? Is the soul of the anima mundi, right? The soul of the world. Which, in most Orthodox Christianity, is kind of declared an idea we don't go, we don't do. But I think sophiology is bring could bring that back, or at least correct it and bring it back. Because, as Traherne says here, right, not his natural, but not his natural body, but which he hath assumed. Let us see how glorious his wisdom is in manifesting himself thereby. And this is Sophia or wisdom. Is and so, and so and in the sophiology I, I, I talk about the mitaksu, the between. It's the, the sophia is the between, the space where God and creation, meaning us too, meet. And this is why in Jakob Burma's uh, theology, philosophy, speculations, that the Virgin Mary is sophia because she is the one who makes the divine palpable. In the incarnation with, of Christ, right? Because no one, no one hath seen God face to face, unless you saw Jesus, right? So, and and Mary makes is the is the Sophia because, as in Proverbs, uh, Sophia or wisdom is what God spreads out over over the the universe, and through through her, she he creates all things. Similarly, through the very Virgin Mary, he recreates all things. So that's one, one way to think about it. But let's move ahead. We could do every single one of these, I swear. We could. To the third century, which is actually probably the most dynamic of the centuries. Um, and it's the most one most quoted. And I think it's it's pretty heroic. He, he really hit his stride with these. And they're all great. I mean, what am I talking about? Um, so the third century, number one. Will you see the infancy of this sublime and celestial greatness? Those pure and virgin apprehensions I had from the womb, and that divine light wherein, wherewith I was born, are the best unto this day, wherein I can see the universe. By the gift of God, they attended me into the world, and by his spe special favor, I remember them till now. Verily, they seem the greatest gifts his wisdom could bestow, for without them all other gifts had, had been dead and vain. They are unattainable by book, and therefore I will teach them by experience. Pray for them earnestly, for they will make you angelical and holy celestial. Certainly Adam in paradise had not been more sweet and curious apprehensions, had not more sweet and curious apprehensions of the world than when I was a child. Going back to that, but this is, is he right or is he wrong, you know? And he says this actually a little bit lower. All time, and this is number two, all time was eternity and a perpetual Sabbath. Now, um, I wonder if he was familiar, he probably was, with the Philadelphian Society. Uh, Jane Led was, the, was, was that, in, during his lifetime, their leader. Um, before that, it had the precursor to the, the formal, <coughs> pardon me, Philadelphian Society of John Portage, and they both, Portage and Jane Led, and also Thomas Bromley, were uh, English readers of Burma, and who you know they kind of were, were turned on fire. It gave it was a new kind of Protestant mysticism, and it's really, in in a way, I think, with Burma. He's he's the mysticism equivalent of Martin Heidegger in philosophy. And when Heidegger started philosophy, he hit the, he hit the reset button. We start over now. And in a way, Burma started a whole new kind of mysticism. There is nothing before him like him. You know, maybe some intimations in Meister Eckhart. But after Burma, it's, it's a different game. And, it, and he created this whole... Uh, genre, we can almost say, of Protestant mysticism. And much of this Protestant mysticism, when we see in the Philadelphian society, uh, was very sociological. In, in fact, Jane Led and, and John Portage both had visions of Sophia. 
she appeared to them. At least they said she appeared to them. You know, so very. You know, so it's interesting that it, that comes from Protestantism, which is not known for for uh, mysticism. And you also see it in William Blake, who was also kind of his own person as far as mysticism goes. Um, and also, who no one can claim. You know, where does he belong? What tradition? Is he a Protestant? I don't even know what he is. Uh, people try to call him a Gnostic. I don't think that's accurate either. So anyway, so this third century, and, and this is where a lot of the poems start to, to creep in. Uh, I want to look at the third or the fifth century number five, or the third century number five. Uh, and I'll read the first parts of it. I'll read the whole thing. Our Savior's meaning when he said he must be born again, become a little child that will enter into the kingdom of heaven is, is deeper far than is generally believed. It is not only in a careless reliance upon divine providence that we are to become little children, or in the feebleness and shortness of our anger and simplicity of our passions, but in the, in the peace and purity of our soul, all our soul. Purity also is a deeper thing than is commonly apprehended. For we must disrobe ourselves of all false colors and then clothe our, our souls of evil habits. All our thoughts must be infant-like and clear, the powers of our soul free from the leaven of this world and disentangled from men's conceits and customs. Grit in the eye or the yellow jaundice will not let a man see those objects truly that are before it. And therefore it is requisite that we should be very strangers to the thoughts, customs, and opinions of men in this world as if we were but little children. So those things would appear to us only which do, do to children when they are first born ambitions, trades, luxuries, inordinate affections, casual and accidental riches invented since the fall would be gone, and only those things appear which did to Adam in paradise in the same light and in the same colors. God in his works, glory in the light, love in our parents, men ourselves in the face of heaven, every man naturally seeing those things to the enjoyment of which he is naturally born. Uh, He's, you know, and uh, two things, other other thinkers actually, come to mind when I read these these words. And of course, he he went back to, unless you become like a little child, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, this kind of faithfulness and trust in the goodness of the universe. I mean, it's certainly you look into the harshness of the world sometimes. It's it's difficult to learn how to trust. Now. One thing it reminds me of is during World War One, Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian philosopher and social revolutionary, you know, that was an anxious time to be living in, in, in Europe, World War One, And he gave to his followers this kind of prayer, you know, about being faithful, about how to learn how to be faithful. So here's what he had to say. We must eradicate from the soul all fear and terror of what comes out of the future. We must acquire serenity in all feelings and sensations about the future. We must look forward to everything that may comes with absolute equanimity. And we must think that whatever comes is given to us by a world direction full of wisdom. It is part of what we must learn in this age, namely to live out of pure trust without any security in existence trusting in the ever-present help of the spiritual world. Truly, nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. So let us discipline our, ourselves and seek the awakening within ourselves every morning and every evening. So this, was, so this is what Steiner is saying is you need to learn how to trust. And when people say this, trust in God. And, and Traherne is full of trust, openness. But how do we do that? It's hard, isn't it? Um, now, here's an example. Um, I, I met a priest once who, uh, whose daughter, he's a married Eastern Rite Catholic priest, whose daughter, she was about two, drank a bottle of Tylenol that she found, and her liver was shutting down. And he was worried. He was supposed to go and give a workshop, and he, you know, he didn't want to go because his daughter was in the hospital. 
And he found, he had knocked over a book of St. Teresa of Avila in his office, and he picked it up, and it was happened to be at the page where Jesus is talking to St. Teresa, and she's complaining that she can't get all this stuff done. And he saw the line, I'm paraphrasing, you know, Jesus basically tells St. Teresa, well, you take care of my business, and I'll take care of yours. And so he went to the thing. But what, before he went, uh, the girl was named after Edith Stein, whose religious name was Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So the little girl, Benedicta, they started praying to, to, for the intercession, uh, in that uh, through the intercession of Edith Stein. And uh, the girl was healed immediately. And when I, when I met the, the priest, you know, one of the things he said was, well, you know what? Radical trust produces radical consequences, you know, which is something I've tried to incorporate into my own life. Not always easy, right? But Edith Stein also, I mean, Edith Stein was, uh, was, a, was a Jewish convert to Catholicism and became a Carmelite nun. But she was, had been an, an agnostic or atheist, uh, but she was a you know really high powered philosopher. She was uh, Edmund Husserl's assistant, and she also reading the autobiography of Teresa of Avila had a conversion experience, and she read the book in one sitting. And said this is the truth. But in one of her other books, she writes about this trust. You know how do we trust in in God? And he said, well, think of a child. And this is, goes back to Traherne. Think of a child. You know. If your father is holding you and you're a child, you don't think he's going to drop you. You know, you don't think your dad's going to drop you or your mother's going to drop you. It's the same thing with our relationship to God, Teresa, uh, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross or Edith Stein says. You know, we don't. That's not going to happen. You have to trust that it'll take care of you. Um, and this is what Traherne says in number seven. The first light which shined in my infancy in its primitive and innocent, innocent clarity was totally eclipsed in so much that I was fain to learn all again. If you ask me how it was eclipsed, truly by the customs and manners of men, which like contrary winds blew it out, by an innumerable company of other objects, rude, vulgar, and worthless things, that like so many loads of earth and dung did overwhelm and bury it, by the impetuous torrent of wrong desires in all others, whom I saw or knew that carried me away and it alienated me from it, by a whole sea of other matters and concernments that covered and drowned it, finally by the evil influence of a bad education that did not foster and cherish it. Boom! By a bad education that did not foster and cherish it. Imagine if we had an education that fostered and cherished it. How different would the world be? It would be absolutely different. And so to finish, why don't we turn back to the first thing we looked at, uh, Traherne's poem, Wonder. And the, but this time we'll look at the last stanza, the eighth stanza. Proprieties themselves were mine, and hedges ornaments, walls, boxes, coffers, and their rich con contents, did not divide my joys, but shine. Clothes, ribbons, jewels, laces, I esteemed my joys by others worn. For me, they all, they all to wear them seemed when I was born. Right? Hedges, ornaments, walls, boxes, coffers, did not divide my joys. Right? Restrictions did not restrict. Confinements did not confine, because all was joy. It uh, reminds me of a line from uh, Rainer Maria Rilke's poem, one of his sons to Orpheus. The liar does not restrict his hand, and it is an overstepping that he obeys. So, so this we have with, with Traherne, right? This, uh, this, this splendor that is before our eyes. And, and the ability to see it, the restoration to that vision. So, well, I'd like to thank you for spending these, these lectures with me, this time with me. Even though we couldn't be together in, in real time, in real space, we can, at least, we can at least do this. And just like 
through reading Traherne or any of the poets we looked at, we can have an agapeic uh, relationship with them. I hope we, you know, and at least you, you and I can communicate in other ways, whether it's through phone or email or whatever, right? So we can have an experience of one another, you know, and that's what I really look forward to when I, when I read the responses from, from you and, and read your emails. It really feels like I'm meeting another, and perhaps we can meet together in, in the real world sometime. But nevertheless, thank you so much. And remember, how like an angel came I down.